Hello and welcome to the Student Solidarity International Skype conversation with Elizabeth Tan. Elizabeth is the International Coordinator for the International Domestic Workers Network and she also has three decades of experience of union organizing. Uh, Elizabeth is based in, in Hong Kong and she has a lot of expertise in what's happen, happening in uh, labor in China. So we're very pleased to have you and thank you for talking to us, Elizabeth. Hello, yeah, I am uh, pleased to have this opportunity to uh, let people know more of, uh, of uh, workers uh, at this side of the world. Thank you very much. So we thought we would speak about two things. We would ask for your assessment on, on labor in, in China and Asia generally, and then also talk about the um, international domestic workers. Um, let's start with China. Uh, it's considered to be the workshop of the world. A lot of the, the world's production happens in China. And um, we don't get a lot of news out of China. We know there are big trade unions, but we also know that there are official organizations which are controlled by the government. We also hear reports of uh, labor unrest, of, of workers taking action outside of the trade unions um, to protest against conditions. And sometimes we hear about very bad conditions at big factories like Foxconn that make um, smartphones for uh, Western Western markets. So I think we're interested in your uh, perception of what's happening and um, yeah, what's the state of, of labor in China? Uh, you know, uh, China is very big and, uh, and development uh, on the labor side is also uh, changing very rapidly. And so the situation is very complex. Uh, I'm from Hong Kong. I uh, uh, know more or uh, know better the situation of uh, uh, workers who are in the south, you know, which are just on the other side of the border. Is that Guangdong? And, uh, Lai Shenzhen, the Pearl River Delta. And then uh, uh, we normally uh, divide uh, uh, labor well into two. Uh, those who uh, belong to the uh, the north of uh, of the north of China and then the south China. And uh, South China, uh, it, on one hand, uh, uh, there is more space. You know, you see a lot of uh, uh, workers' uh, agitations uh, going out to the streets, you know, even to block the traffic. And and this kind of uh, stories normally happen in the south, and uh, you know, workers like you know have more freedom to act. But uh, it's also because uh, laws are much uh, poorly implemented in the south than in the north. So uh, in the north, uh, labor laws uh, to a larger extent is being implemented. But then on the other hand, the problem is because it's closer to the center, to Beijing, uh, it's more difficult uh, for workers to uh, have uh, self-organizations, to have uh, independent actions. Um, but uh, since last year, uh, even the workers in the South uh, begin to experience some more uh, control. Uh, uh, there are, are some uh, labor independent organizations. Uh, we call them labor NGOs uh, because, uh, you know, in China, uh, workers cannot register trade unions outside the official trade union federation, the ACFTU. Uh, but uh, last year, some of these uh, NGOs also faced difficulties and have to close down. So uh, uh, probably uh, this is something, uh, you know, you will not hear very much because uh, you know workers are agitating, workers are having a lot of actions, but then uh, actually it's not that easy. You know, still there is a lot of uh, control, a lot of suppressions. And uh, and a lot of uh, uh, labor centers, labor NGOs, even though they they just do uh, 
labor rights consultation, they do uh, cultural uh, or they do uh, uh, welfare services, but they open and closed, open and closed, because uh, uh, their existence is not guaranteed. There's no way that uh, uh, they are guaranteed, you know, their operation. So um, uh, I, it, it partly explains why it is uh, so difficult to organize workers in China, despite you know a lot of workers have uh, come out, you know, have uh, 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 protested, you know, they they don't mind, but uh, but the control is really immense, so it's really difficult. Um, uh, so uh, when I uh, go to other countries, uh, I always hear people say saying that uh, China has changed. Uh, there is a lot of uh, freedom. Uh, people uh, can uh, uh, can do a lot of things. Uh, it's like uh, us outside, but uh, but but it's not true. Um. My my understanding is one of the things that makes it difficult to organize um, culturally is that um, a lot of the workers in the factories are migrant workers who come from the countryside and it's difficult for them to get long-term residence permits in a city and many of them have no real intention of staying, staying long-term so it's difficult to build an activist base of people who are in a place for a long time and engaged in a social struggle because people make as much money as possible and then leave. Is, is that still the case? Uh, no, it's, it's changing. Uh, three years ago, uh, the, uh, the, there's a big strike at, uh, at the car factories uh, of, uh, of uh, Japanese companies, the Toyota and then Honda. And uh, most of the workers who worked there in those car factories and went on strike uh, were uh, young workers uh, and also uh, coming from the rural areas and and the difference was that uh, they were young so today uh, we are having a second generation of migrant workers and they are very different from their parents so what you just described uh, were true with their parents you know, they try to come to the city to uh, to work hard and to earn as much as they can, and then bring money home. And they they were also thinking uh, at the end uh, of my working life, I will go back to my village. But now we have the second generation. You know, the the, the young people, uh, even though they are from the villages, but they may not think about one day they will go back to the village. Now they begin to think, uh, perhaps I will just settle down in the cities and uh, and live here, uh, continue my future life here in the city. And uh, and also uh, they are they are poor, of course, but they are uh, not as hard pressed as their parents. So somehow they have, uh, uh, you know. Uh, um, a free mind uh, to decide what they want to do. So, uh, so that is why now they begin to see the need to uh, have higher salaries, for example, because they want to rent uh, houses, they want to rent flats in the cities for longer terms, and also because they are thinking they will get married and then they will bring their uh, spouse, uh, they will have children, and they they also think in uh, they will have uh, long time. They still they also need other kind of uh, social benefits, uh, social uh, securities. So that is why um, uh, three years ago, the uh, this group of workers at the Honda at the Toyota factories uh, went on strike. You know they were demanding for higher wages. They were demanding for uh, seniority pay. Uh, and uh, this was a watershed because before that, most of the workers' actions were desperate actions. That is, 
they wanted uh, wages back because they work and work, but then they were not paid for two months, three months, and out of desperation, they they went on strike. They went out to the street, blocked the traffic. But now more and more workers, uh, most of them are young workers, go on strike because they are asking for higher wages. They are asking for. Uh, better representation in the workplace so that they can uh, talk with the employers. So, so it, it's, it's different. And that is why uh, I think the future is more hopeful uh, because, uh, you know, these uh, young workers, even though they are migrants uh, from the villages, but they, they see their future in the cities. Okay. So, you know, this will uh, have uh, you know, a, a very different uh, uh, implications. Okay. Um, the journalist Paul Mason feels that one of the big reasons for um, the uprisings across the world last year, the Arab Spring and also in parts of Europe, yeah. is um, a lot of very well educated young people who see no opportunities or who are underemployed. Is it also true that this new generation of workers in China is, is quite well educated? Uh, yes, they are better educated, uh, but uh, a more important reason is uh, the uh, widespread use of, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, information technologies. Uh, China uh, is, uh, is either the first or the second country in the world you know, where uh, there is uh, uh, a big user of uh, internet and, uh, and and blogs and a lot of uh, uh, citizens you know, have come out to uh, demand uh, for for land rights uh, to uh, protest against a lot of injustices uh, because uh, they uh, they are being uh, informed through uh, uh, blogs and um, uh, the SMS and and uh, similarly a lot of workers uh, especially the young workers they spend a lot of free time in uh, with the computers and they learn a lot uh, uh, from the Facebooks uh, from uh, websites and uh, so of course the government is trying to block and uh, and this is uh, high on the agenda of the government uh, for this year that is to block a lot of uh, internet access but still you know the this world is so big you know how much you can you can you can block and uh, and this has uh, uh, give, uh, given a lot of information uh, of all kinds you know including uh, people's uh, movements and uh, information uh, to these uh, uh, workers and, um, and and they are also very interested in this. And I, I remember uh, last year when I was in a clothing factory, uh, which was a supplier to uh, Debenham in the UK. And I talked to the workers, they, uh, I, no, I was talking to the manager and he told me, you know, nowadays uh, one of our headache is uh, is uh, to stop workers from uh, trying to uh, use their uh, cell phone uh, to uh, uh, you know to to uh, to do uh, SMS to uh, to uh, uh, go to the website during work, and uh, and they said and the manager says it's very difficult to stop workers because you know the cell phone is so small and then they always carry in the pocket, and uh, and then they try to. Uh, to take it out and then started to uh, uh, do SMS and and uh, yeah and uh, and go to blogs and yeah and uh, and I think this is a very a, a very very important tool uh, because they also link up themselves uh, through uh, WhatsApps and uh, blogs like this and, uh, and and that's how they organize and that is really uh, giving a lot of headache to uh, management, uh, company management, and also to the government because they don't know how to stop this. You know, they can also communicate with us in Hong Kong. <laughs> and uh, uh, during some of the strikes, uh, the workers' leaders uh, send messages to 
uh, people in Hong Kong and ask for advice, you know, uh, what to do next. Uh, now they are on strike. And so uh, it's really fast and really easy. We can also tell them, you know, what to do. And yes, this is uh, this is exciting time. <laughs> that is that is a very exciting and interesting development. Um, I've, I've got just one more question about um, labor in China, and that is, what do you think the response of the official unions will be? Um, are they likely to become more representative or to represent people better, um, or how how will they respond to this this change in the in the workforce? They want to. They they uh, they they. Uh, they wish they they will be uh, uh, representative, and even the the government, the government uh, design is uh, the the official trade union, the ACFTU, uh, will represent workers and will speak on behalf of them and decide on behalf of them, and so the world is quiet. But unfortunately, it can't do it because at the end of the day, they have to uh, toe the party line. And uh, and they they try to uh, represent workers, but only can do it up to a certain point. You know when uh, when uh, when the conflict of interest uh, between the workers and the and the management, you know, the capital or, or the government becomes uh, too intense, then the union, the ACFTU, will go back uh, to the to the party line, and then. They abandon the workers, and then the workers will will uh, decide for themselves. And then there, but then there are too many stories like this. And um, uh, in the in the last two years, you know, there have been a lot of talk about how the ACFTU is trying to, uh, to reform itself. But then, uh, if if you look at uh, uh, the details of these uh, strike actions by the workers. The successful ones, that is, uh, workers succeed to uh, get their, uh, the, their their goals, uh, are all by workers' uh, own self-organizing, and uh, none of them uh, have been uh, uh, through the official union. So, yeah. So, uh, uh, workers are now also not know that they have to rely on themselves and and we have to uh, give them support and give them confidence that yes uh, workers if you are uh, united you can do it yourself um, thank you elizabeth that's a really um, insightful perspective on what's happening in a crucial region of the world economy um, let's talk about your other work um, with the international My domestic work yes <laughs> um, Perhaps uh, tell us about the network and why it's important. Uh, the network is very young. Uh, it was uh, launched in 2009 uh, when uh, uh, some domestic workers organization from different countries uh, went to Geneva uh, to attend the International Labour Conference uh, which at that time was trying to uh, get a international labor convention for domestic workers uh, adopted, and so uh, we gathered there, and uh, and then we in we we felt you know uh, why can't we uh, form uh, a more solid organizations, so we uh, decided at that time, but officially we. Uh, have not uh, really registered. Uh, we are not formally constituted, and and we have planned to have our founding congress this October. And this is important because uh, even though it's still informal, but uh, we have now uh, uh, gathered together over seventy domestic workers organizations uh, in uh, different parts of the world, and uh, we are. Uh, very closely uh, linked together. Um, can you tell us the the aim of the organization and why why it's important to to form this international network? Um, you know, um, you know, domestic workers actually are many. Uh, 
officially uh, the ILO says uh, they are over 50 million, but we believe uh, actually there are still more. Uh, but uh, you know, in uh, most of the places, uh, nobody really take them seriously. You know, people think they are they are they are nothing. You know, and they are not considered as workers. And uh, the uh, the ILO Convention on Domestic Workers, uh, the C one eight nine, was adopted uh, almost two years ago, and it make a, a a big change in in many many countries and in many many ways. I think for the first time, people suddenly uh, realized, oh, wow, uh, domestic workers, and. Uh, and they are they are important because uh, uh, the, even the UN is talking uh, big about them, and uh, and then uh, people start to talk about workers' rights of domestic workers, human rights of domestic workers, and uh, and uh, um, my organization is trying to uh, uh, build organization of domestic workers. You know, this is our number one, our key objective, because uh, we believe, uh, you know, there is a momentum now, but uh, in order to secure this uh, game, and uh, we must um, uh, keep this momentum, and how? You know, it, it has to be done by domestic workers themselves, you know, like, just like workers in other sectors, you know, they have to rely on the trade unions. So domestic workers also have to build the organizations, and that is our key uh, activity now. You know, trying in different countries and help domestic workers to uh, build their organizations. Um, are, are you trying to get individual countries to improve protections for the labor rights of uh, domestic workers? Is that part of the aim as well to to get oh, law oh, yes, changed? Yes. Um, uh -huh. Yes. Yes. Um, uh, these are like uh, two uh, two legs. Uh, you know, on one hand, uh, domestic workers are trying to uh, advocate for new laws, uh, new legislations uh, in the countries to uh, press the government to ratify the convention. Uh, but then, on the other hand, uh, when they uh, group together to do these actions. Uh, uh, we have to make sure they will also uh, build a uh, solid base, you know, build permanent organization. So they don't just uh, come together to uh, press for the laws or legislation, but uh, at the same time build the organizations. And um, and uh, uh, fortunately, you know, because of uh, uh, so much uh, interest and uh, and support also from uh, other sectors you know other other players you know like uh, the ILOs and also many trade union national centers uh, they you know they can do much more than they used to be in the past it it seems uh, like tactically it's a very difficult thing to do because if you have 50 million domestic workers, you probably have 50 million employers as well. And yeah. each each of those people mm -hmm. is isolated alone somewhere with a relationship with a particular employer. Sometimes that relationship is quite intimate and personal because they've been there for a long time and they, they, they know the family very well. And it mm -hmm. makes organizing and negotiating very important, uh, very difficult. And yeah. so it's encouraging to hear that there is this, this attempt um, to, to do it internationally and um, but if you have any ideas about how you can actually break out of that uh, that isolation I'd, I'd love to hear them uh, actually there are many many models uh, some are more successful than the others and one of our uh, our role is to facilitate this uh, cross learning so uh, what is working in one place uh, can also share the experience with others uh, who have not found the way out yet. Uh, for example, uh, in Hong Kong, uh, all the domestic workers, including migrant domestic workers, are covered by the same labor legislations as the local workers. 
And uh, unfortunately, and I'm uh, ashamed to say, in my region, uh, Asian region, domestic workers are treated very badly. And uh, and Hong Kong is is an exceptional case. Uh, but uh, because we have this uh, uh, unique situation, and we are now trying uh, to uh, tell uh, other governments uh, in our region, you know, in Thailand, Malaysia, uh, Singapore, uh, that you know, it is possible to protect domestic workers as you protect other workers. Because in Hong Kong, it is happening. Domestic workers have uh, weekly rest, they have annual leave, uh, they have sick leave, uh, they uh, they have minimum wage. So you know, it's it it is uh, it's possible. And um, uh, and so now this year, uh, things start to change. Uh, even with a very very uh, uh, from very very bad situation, but uh, Singapore this year uh, started to uh, give workers a weekly rest. That is uh, a day off in in a week. Uh, this is very small, but you know. Uh, for the first time, domestic workers in Singapore will have uh, a weekly rest, and and uh, and the same thing is happening also in Thailand. They they have uh, passed uh, a domestic workers law to protect domestic workers. Um, and uh, last September, uh, also the in India, uh, the parliament has amended the sexual harassment bill. Uh, which for the first time includes domestic workers in the protection. So you know things are starting to change, and um, and we just have to uh, you know, uh, tell the world you know uh, what is happening here and there, and and uh, and and to show that you know it is possible uh, you know to uh, to have this uh, protection for domestic workers. Well, those seem like small but encouraging signs, and the fact that there, there, something is being done at least means there's a recognition that, that there is a need for greater protection, and uh, we'll certainly be following with great interest um, your work and publicizing it as much as we can. Um, you said earlier that uh, you're planning to go on a protest tomorrow. Can you tell us a little bit about what that's about? Uh, yes, uh, tomorrow uh, there will be representatives of uh, human rights and uh, labor unions in Hong Kong going to uh, the consulate of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia uh, to submit uh, our protest letters uh, because uh, the government executed uh, migrant domestic workers working in Saudi Arabia and uh, she came from Sri Lanka. And uh, the reason uh, is about a crime which has not been proven. Uh, she was accused of uh, killing uh, a baby uh, seven years ago. Uh, the baby died uh, when she was uh, taking care of her, uh, but there was never a thorough investigation uh, into the case. and. Uh, uh, since uh, it happened seven years ago, uh, uh, this uh, Sri Lankan domestic workers has been imprisoned, and uh, she has not uh, been uh, given uh, legal services, and she has not even uh, an interpreter. And uh, in the courts, uh, the the, uh, the whole procedure is uh, in uh, uh, Arabic, and which she didn't understand, and. And so you know the whole system is is unjust, and uh, and that is why uh, you know we are we feel so angry about you know there are so many uh, migrant domestic workers working in Saudi Arabia from uh, uh, very poor countries. They go there because uh, they are desperate. They 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 need money. Uh, so much for the families. They have to go to to take the risk to work there, and uh, and sometimes uh, they are also being trafficked uh, there. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, this uh, 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 domestic workers uh, just being executed 
uh, when she went, she was only 17 years old. And uh, according to the local law, um, she was not supposed uh, to enter the country to work because uh, she was too young. But then uh, the recruitment agency uh, falsified her uh, her ID uh, and uh, make a false document. And that is why she was uh, 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 there to work. And um, yes, uh, so we... Uh, we will uh, hand our plot, hand in a protest letter tomorrow, and we demand uh, the Saudi Arabia government uh, to stop doing this uh, to migrant domestic workers, in particularly because you know really they are so vulnerable, and uh, and they have to reform their law, they have to reform their policies, they have to uh, bring uh, uh, law and policy and the, and their legal system in line with the international standard. And that's a, it's a really horrifying case, Elizabeth, and um, I hope your protest tomorrow is, is successful. Um, thank you very much for your, for your time today. I don't have any other questions. I'm not sure if there's anything you'd like to add uh, before, we, before we finish. Uh, I'm just uh, very pleased to have this opportunity to talk about domestic workers because still uh, many people uh, uh, in many countries uh, think that uh, there are no domestic workers there, but actually it's not true because they are so invisible and people normally think, oh, in my country there's no domestic workers, but uh, it's not true. Thank you. Thanks again, Elizabeth. Thank you.